Everyone, thank you, Sanya, for this nice introduction. Uh, my guest today is Filip Mitricevic. Filip is a PhD candidate in modern East European history at Indiana University Bloomington. He completed his BA and MA degrees in history at the University of Novi Sad. Uh, the title of his presentation today is Diplomacy with Memory, the case of communist Yugoslavia. So Philip is going to talk about the theoretical assumptions of historical memory in an international context, the revolution of global history that led to it, as well as how he employed that principle in his research. Uh, in other words, Philip will reflect on historical legacies and culture of remembrance as a viable diplomatic tool, as well as the necessary historiographical shift that foster these new perspectives, the expansion of course of study beyond the national state. This is a very current topic, and that is the main reason why I've invited him today, but also I was motivated uh, by this year call for fellowship, which focuses on young people. So Philip is a very young and very successful researcher. <laughs> and since I believe that you have all seen his biography and abstract of the lecture, I would not take any more time. Philip, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much, and thank you for the young adjective. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll take that. Uh, Thirty four is young only in Serbia still. Uh, good morning and good day. Uh, good morning. It's it's seven a.m. in Indiana. Uh, so if I seem a bit mentally disjointed, it's because I haven't had breakfast yet. Um, thank you for the invitation, and it's truly an honor to to talk to you today. And, and kind of uh, present some of my research because this is an ongoing project, my, my doctoral dis dissertation, and also kind of bounce some of the ideas off you and uh, get, hopefully get some, get some feedback. And I'm just gonna start my, my presentation now. Um, okay, let's see. Okay, um, as you can see, the title of today's talk is Diplomacy with Memory, the Case of Communist Yugoslavia. Uh, but before we jump into it, I think that the title and the keywords require some explanation. I, I like to assume that my listeners know nothing about what I'm going to talk about, uh, not because I have you in low regard, uh, but because I want to make sure nothing is left unclear. Uh, I like to envision uh, a diverse crowd with uh, differing expertise or different levels of expertise. So I like to bring the story closer to those that might have never heard about these terms. But I apologize in advance to those that might have some expertise in this and find my story too simplistic. So let's dive into a short theoretical introduction. Um, the two key terms, as you see highlighted here, are memory and diplomacy. Uh, probably not something you would often see together. So let's unpack what is memory and how it came to be associated with diplomacy. The two columns um, of terms on each side here represent the gist of what we're going to talk about, and, and they represent the challenge of interdisciplinary interplay that, that helped me um, reach my research project and hopefully a sustainable argument. The first one to our left uh, revolves around memory and how the notion of collective memory evolved. These terms are sometimes in contradiction or opposition, but they are all fairly synonymous and represent either the same thing or a slightly different interpretation or evolutionary stage in developing the notion of, of collective memory. And the same can be said about the second important framework for today, and that is the evolution of global history. And so let's start with the with the first very simplistic uh, question: What is memory? And we would we would have to jump back into the past, to the late nineteenth century to twentieth century Europe, and the developments in codification of psychology as as a modern discipline. And one of the most intriguing questions back then and still probably would is was what is memory? What is the nature of memory? And it, in in simple terms you know, theorists took two opposing positions. One, that memory falls in the domain of uh, physiological 
uh, basically as an inherent biological capacity of retention, uh, fully independent of what is happening around you. And the second position was that memory cannot be separated from external influences, that the memories forming in your mind are the results of interactions with your surroundings, simply put. Uh, as far as I know, that that's still the debate, uh, but uh, I don't want to talk about psychology. That's, that's not my expertise. But in the interwar period, we get a thinker, French thinker, Maurice Alvache, I'm sorry if I'm butchering that, uh, who's looming in the background here in the picture, um, a French theorist, like I said, who's who was deeply into uh, the world of multidisciplinary uh, studies, uh, a student of, of uh, Henri Bergson and, and Emile Durkheim. Alvash found his place between philosophy, sociology, and psychology, and in 1925, he published his seminal work, uh, which is titled right there in French, which I'm not going to read, giving definition to what we, uh, to what he called collective memory. And, and he posited that a society can have a collective memory dependent upon the framework within uh, which that society is operating. So he believed that individuals' understanding of the past is strongly linked to the to this kind of group consciousness because every person can contribute uh, a different memory or perspective to that collective one. Uh, so that collective memory is then different for every group that experiences a certain event and so he said every group has its own collective memory and that collective memory differs from the collective memory of other groups. Um, what it actually is, how does it manifest? Well, you know, it's the plethora of, of, of human actions uh, like commemorations, uh, building monuments, celebrations, uh, establishing uh, important dates. Um, anything that is given context by a certain group. So a kind of a, a codification of the interpretation of the past. Um, it is kind of important to note at this point that, that, that he observed a very hard border between history and collective memory, seeing history as a, as a discipline, a science that exists on its need to kind of seek an established truth. Uh, collective memory was a principle that he used to, to describe the elusiveness of that truth, so so to say, uh, that more often than not, what rules is perspective and not not necessarily to truth. Um, unfortunately, Advash was was killed in in, in Buchenwald. Uh, he died an established thinker, but collective memory did not take full flight so to say, until the 1980s. And it was it was another Frenchman, of course, is always the French when it comes to theory, who took over the torch. Uh, it was Pierre Nora, um, a historian whose four-volume work titled uh, Le Lieu de Mémoire, let's say, uh, or in English, The Re Realms of, of, of Memory, uh, kind of became so prominent and, and, and so big uh, in the historiographical world that that it resonated and and, and uh, it echoed with a high popularity in memory studies for the for the sub subsequent decades. Um, as as you can see here, this is this is the volume one of his of his truly seminal and 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 and, and great work. It says that. Uh, the subtitle is is the constructions of the French past, and that is exactly, uh, you know, in line with what what Altbach said about collective memory construction being the operative world uh, there, and kind of the process of of constructing an image of the past. Uh, and I put the the definition of uh, lieu de mémoire. In, in Nora's mind, uh, 
because I think it's it's important. And it says a lieu de memoir is any significant entity, whether material or non-material in nature, which by dint of human will or the work of time has become a symbolic element of the memorial heritage of any community, in, in his case, in this case, the French community. And I think it's a useful uh, definition simply because it has a very bro broad scope, pardon me, acknowledging any entity, material or non-material, uh, which is important for me because I later on decided to focus on the non-material that you know can come to bear symbolic value. Uh, of course, this is this is not by it's by no means a definitive definition of what what memory is. Uh, it has been criticized. It has been questioned. Uh, even the concept of collective memory was 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 questioned. I'm I'm working under a supervisor, uh, Professor Maria Bohor who said that there's no such a thing as a collective memory because she said, uh, what is the product of this collective memory? It doesn't exist. So memory is a process uh, and, and so on so, and so on. Now, important distinction that, that, that we have to make here, again, that it's important for, for what I'm going to talk about is that, and there's hardly any consensus on these questions, but what we can filter out of the many attempts to encapsulate collective memory is the distinguishing between what we call memory politics and memory from below. One is a top-down, you know, state-driven, ideology-laden, uh, universality targeting, uh, but not always successful project. Uh, the other social or local, uh, perhaps local tradition-driven, in tune with the cycles of life, uh, more accepted on on, on the on, on a lower scale, but uh, as equally as abstract of a notion. Uh, I make this distinction because uh, my work focuses on memory politics. Uh, it's uh, it's a strictly I observe a strictly top down uh, state bound processes. So, so that's that that's going to be important um, going forward. And if you were asking yourselves, no, the the Mount Rushmore did not happen like this naturally. It was it was actually man made. Uh, I checked. I'm just joking. Um, so having establishing that 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 kind of notion of what is memory, or in our context, what is memory, uh, I would like to make the jump into into historiography. Uh, and how global history came to be. I, I, I put this 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 kind of uh, illustrative collage to 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 emphasize my point that you know, history initially, uh, when it was codified, pardon me, as a, as a, as a scientific discipline in the early, uh, the first half of the 19th century, it, it was with a specific purpose, and that was to legitimize the new creation that was the nation. Uh, to this day, history is often uh, a servant of the nation. However, in, in time, it evolved in, in, into being many different things. And the 20th century provided a lot of you know, global, social, political, uh, military ruptures that uh, brought on a shifting perspective on humanity's past. Uh, the destruction of World War II, represented here in the in the middle, uh, significantly refashioned the people's perspective of the world. Uh, kind of nothing being the same after that kind of, of, of destruction. Um, and after World War II and the Holocaust, that, that would all have major ramification, major ramifications for memory as well, especially in Europe and the, and the, and the project of uh, unifying Europe. But World War II, beyond its destruction, uh, also had uh, effects in kind of liberating the rest of the world. 
uh, new portions of the world became increasingly visible simply by shedding, you know, the burdens of uh, colonialism. And this is not Malcolm X. This is actually Patrice Lumumba uh, here on the left. Uh, you know, voices from other places, let's call them that, you know, under quotes, started to matter. And it was by force of their own merit in, in a fierce struggle to gain independence from colonial powers. And of course that, that also shifted, uh, changed a lot of, or forced the change of a lot of the perspectives. And then finally, you know, represented here by Gordon Gecko, uh, in the nineties, we have a revolution in the ways of, of, of how people communicated. Communication basically shrunk the world. Uh, and so all of a sudden, uh, some people saw the world as a mesh of networks instead of a system of borders. And that's coming out of, you know, the Cold War, the block system, the Iron Curtain and all that. And all of a sudden, people started looking also back to the past, for examples of, of, of these networks. And then we kind of come to what some people call the global turn or the revolution of the of the global history. Uh, I I put this book on because I think it's a pardon me. I think it's a wonderful example. Sebastian Conrad's "What Is Global History," uh, published by Princeton in in twenty sixteen. I think it's it's a, it's a wonderful synthesis, uh, kind of an overview of 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 what what is global history how it came to be uh the prehistory of global history and all the definitions and and methodological approaches that it allows um of course there are many other authors uh bailey kenneth pomeran kenneth pomerans is in bloomington today by the way uh that that kind of embraced the this 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 movement and 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 this uh wonderful expansion of of uh what can be the scope of of history and i i decided to put this definition that that uh, conrad put forward that says the aim of global history is not to write a total history of the planet it is often more a matter of writing a history of demarcated or non-global spaces but with an awareness of global connections and structural conditions. Uh, and one of the, the kind of consequences of that is that, you know, the common thread connecting these kinds of studies is the general insight that no society, nation, or civilization exists in isolation. And, you know, someone might ask, so what, it, what is this global history actually studying? Uh, well, it kind of puts it in maybe three different groups in that it studies uh, regions, and these regions can be basically whatever, whatever large spaces, uh, oceans, uh, you, you know, anything that it's not a, a, a kind of an established pre-codified notion of a space like uh, the nation state. Um, number two, it, it focuses on whatever global networks or organizations. So it can study uh, solidarity networks of feminism globally or in a specific region. Uh, it also focuses on, on micro history, but micro history as a mirror of the global. And that, that was... Uh, this was kind of a revolution in my thinking about my project. And when I met Professor Pedro Machado, who is our professor of global history, it kind of opened up uh, my thinking beyond the nation state, uh, even though we in the, in the former Yugoslav space like to, like to think we're thinking across the border. Uh, when you look back, it's it, it's kind of difficult to distinguish that from the state that already existed. But uh, that's a that's a discussion. Um, so the next question that that kind of surfaces and surfaced for me is 
does this revolution of global history mean that, that memory also doesn't have to be confined within national history? And the answer is, of course, it doesn't. Um, fairly recently, uh, we're talking about maybe the last couple of decades or even less, uh, researchers have reached out for principles of, of prosthetic memory uh, put forward by by Alison Lasberg here, which which I put as a as, as a quote that that I feel is key. That it says modern technologies can structure quote unquote imagined communities that are not necessarily geographically or nationally tied, and that and that do not presume any kind of affinity among community members. So it kind of broke the mold of 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 memory in that primordial function of, of it serving the kind of myth making of the nation. Uh, and, and all of a sudden we, we come to having a sort of a definition or inclusion of collective memory uh, into uh, states foreign policy. And I selected this quote by uh, Catherine Bachleitner, that says collective memory enters a state's foreign policy behavior either as an integral part of the country's identity and its decision makers mindset or as an instrumental tool to legitimize international decisions behaviors and goals uh, and also by brian etheridge that says there is no requirement that the actor or the narrative have an organic relationship with the community uh, and so from there, I kind of reached my, my eventual project. Uh, and I decided for it to be Yugoslavia out of laziness. I, I know the I know the language, so I didn't have to learn another research language. Uh, but I I kind of observed an opportunity for Im implementing these uh these approaches. As we all know, Yugoslavia steps out of World War II with a with a new regime. Uh something that that's that's not up to debate, at least for me, with uh, a homegrown communist resistance uh on the victorious side of, of anti-fascist struggle, uh the only resistance in, in the Yugoslav space. Uh and the need now, the need then was to establish the new state and to kind of legitimize it. And so the situation that, that we have on one cold November morning in 1946 is that Tito stood on the on the newly constructed bridge crossing the Danube between Belgrade and and, and Panchevo. And, you know, the memories of the war were probably very fresh, uh, for, probably fresh enough for Tito and maybe other veterans present there uh, to have the lingering smell of blood and, and gunpowder in their nostrils. Uh, and then also the memory of the killings between different ethnic groups uh, comprising this, this new Yugoslav nation was, was equally as, as, as vibrant. And But the time was then to establish how citizens of, of that new communist Yugoslavia would commemorate World War II. And, you know, the dignitaries had to identify the, the path of, of the most efficient way how to do it, because probably identifying perpetrators and victims of war crimes might have led to, to never ending inter-ethnic conflicts in Yugoslavia. It was one thing that, that brought them all together. All these groups contributed to the communist resistance movement uh, and thus the victory against fascism uh, as Yugoslavia was a, 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 the only example of a state in Eastern Europe that experienced a successful autochthonous uh, communist takeover after World War II. But the success of the that takeover was far from easy or guaranteed. Um, in 1945, 
uh, after four years of foreign occupation, domestic, domestic collaboration, and uh, basically a civil war that claimed hundreds of thousands of lives uh, and resulting in fault lines between many different communities, uh, Yugoslavia emerged with this uh, out of the war with this with this new regime. And as soon as the war ended, the regime found it imperative to construct an origin story uh, focused on wartime experiences to consolidate its legitimacy and ensure socialist Yugoslavia's sovereignty. Uh, internationally, Yugoslav regime pushed for the state's participation in the Soviet-dominated bloc of, of people's democracies. Uh, the regime depicted the war struggle as part of a pan-Slavic anti-fascist effort meant mostly to represent the unity of Yugoslav nationalities and Yugoslavia's unity uh, with the USSR, even though far from being a simply uh, Slavic effort. And so we go back to that cold November morning in 1946, Tito standing on the bridge and the Soviet ambassador uh, Anatoly Lavrentiev uh, standing next to him. Uh, it was the day of the Republic, so November 29th, uh, kind of marking the moment three years prior when the new Socialist Republic was born amid the, the war destruction. And the speech you know, on that new bridge, named after the Soviet Red Army, uh, said that for Belgrade, anti-fascist liberation came from the East. Uh, and Ninko Petrovich, uh, the then mayor of Belgrade said, this bridge represents our capital's quickest connection to the East, to the Soviet capital of Moscow. Uh, and the, the whole kind of celebration was Yugoslav and Soviet dignitaries glorifying Tito and Stalin as leaders of a pan-Slavic anti-fascist movement moving Eastern Europe and hopefully you know, the world towards a socialist revolution. But you know, then the 1948 happened, not, not to go too deeply into it, uh, all ties were, were severed from the from the from the Soviet Union, and that comes after four years of, of Tito visiting only Eastern European countries, only countries of the of the Eastern Bloc, and nobody else coming to Yugoslavia other than leaders of of the communist bloc. Uh, and now you have a you have a gaping hole between 1948 in 1953 of Tito not leaving the country and the first next visit being to London. But for us more important, for me more important is that nobody of the world dignitaries, uh, well, the world leaders actually came to Belgrade between 1948 and 1954. And we're gonna see who the first one was. Uh, but this, this abrupt, uh, break from, from the previously set alliances introduced a major challenge for the Yugoslav regime and its survival. But their quick crisis management introduced anti-Stalinism as part of the regime's legitimating discourse. So they reinvented themselves as champions of self-managing socialism and international independence. Uh, now, Again, going back to the state's multi-ethnic and multi-religious composition and the traumatic legacies of, of wartime violence, um, now coupled with, uh, with the external threat, uh, they kind of pushed that, that partisan anti-fascist uprising and the Yugoslav uh, people's liberation struggle as the national myth even harder. But after the Tito-Stalin break, the Yugoslav regime prioritized the immense Yugoslav sacrifices of the anti-fascist rebellion, and there was no more Soviets there. Uh, however, that, that kind of inward-facing view of the recent past did not limit the Yugoslav perspective of the present, and especially the future, 
uh, to either you know east or the west. It it slowly opened, though it was initially helped by the west. Of course, it slowly opened an alternative path, the kind of that that new form of of sacralization emphasized the human and material cost of of achieving liberty in the new Yugoslav socialist and independent state. And, and that propagation, actually, of the, that propagation of independence had major ramifications for Yugoslavia's foreign policy. And in 1954, a somewhat unlikely visitor came to Belgrade. It was uh, the Ethiopian emperor, Haile Selassie. And my, my dissertation talks about the period from 1948 until 1961 and, and the first conference of the non-aligned movement. But for, for this talk today, I, I opted for just one event, this Haile Selassie's visit to Belgrade in 1954, uh, because I, I, I want to present it in detail and I also want to want to emphasize it as uh, as a really important moment uh in kind of that that shift in foreign policy because you know six months after this Tito goes uh to India and it's that that uh a famous trip that historians usually take as the start of of the of the story of the non alignment um when Tito went to India and and then Burma but in this visit I also kind of see uh a change and I see a change in that how the Yugoslav regime legitimized its position domestically and internationally so 1954, Haile Selassie uh, comes to Belgrade, and it's a uh, it's a fairly dissimilar uh, situation to what we had on that on that bridge just just eight uh, eight years before that. Uh, you know, speeches by the two leaders brimmed with uh, appreciation for the mutual history of anti-fascist struggle and war sacrifices for independence. Uh, as the ultimate ideal, um, and perhaps, I mean, not perhaps, but definitely surprising for a festivity in a socialist country and celebrating its identity in the recent revolutionary past, uh, this celebration omitted socialism completely. Uh, you know, Tito spoke of Yugoslav recent past as reflecting a nation's need for drastic change. Uh, and independent development stemming from a harsh fight for freedom. And Haile Selassie approved that, that fully, and, and he continued to cite Yugoslav example as a guiding light uh, for every nation kind of seeking independence from oppressors uh, while seeking its, its unique path. And I, I, I found... Uh, I like to believe I found my opportunity there because I, I chose to employ language uh, as a tool for deciphering how the Yugoslav regime negotiated and projected reality and power in, in the early Cold War years. Uh, my language, simply language, is a very effective tool in exercising power and conveying symbolic value. That's one. Uh, it's also the primary tool of, of diplomacy. And that's why I put this, this, this quote by uh, David Machen and a Andrea Mayer. It says, how we talk about the world influences the society we create, the knowledge we celebrate and despise, and the institutions we build. And it led me to critical discourse analysis uh, as as the primary methodological tool of my of my research and as my study's primary research object as you can see on the screen i i do not treat language simply as a vehicle of communication but as a means of social and political construction 
uh, language does not necessarily emanate power, nor does power necessarily derive from language, but language can be a precise tool in either subverting or exercising power. In my study, that, that exercise is the Yugoslav regime's claim to be in the position of power and shape the views of both the Yugoslavs and global audiences. And so I deconstruct language components to sure, show their use as a power exercising tool while remaining aware of the local and global contexts at every uh, moment. And I present here some of the key, key notions, uh, uh, key, key tools for, for, for my, my research. And one of the key notions for understanding the discursive intervention and, in, in, let's say, Tito's speech from that, that day uh, meeting Haile Selassie is recontextualization. Uh, and it's more than just repeating a previously delivered text in a new context. It, it necessitates uh, discursive transformations by means of uh, addition, deletion, substitution, and rearrangement. And I would like to focus on, on deletion. Uh, but before that, I have to say that, that these discursive practices are primarily used to analyze how existing speeches or texts go through changes between different interlocutors or different differing levels of power and authority by fitting their content into a new context. However, pardon, um, I, I argue that they are an equally effective analytical tool when observing original political speeches belonging to a specific genre and dependent on, on familiar and often circulated tropes. Uh, Tito's speech from July 21st, 1954 was an original one, but it abound in, in, in previously used utterances and familiar tropes employed within the suggested uh, kind of multi-directional legitimation tour, uh, discourse. By, by multi-directional, I, I mean uh, domestic and international. Uh, so I highlight, highlighted deletion or simply put, answering the question of what is conspicuously missing. And you know, for the Yugoslav citizens, the moment of Selassie's visit represented an emotionally intense time and is inextricably bound with both component of the official memory politics, World War II anti-fascism and the subsequent socialist revolution, uh, which was propagated vigorously by the regime during each year's celebration of national holidays. Uh, so arguably the most prominent feature of Tito's speech is the blaring absence of socialism in name. Uh, and not only that, in all the days that Haile Selassie was in Belgrade, uh, the daily coverage of Politica uh, and, you know, the visit and the surrounding events uh, for the Yugoslav readers did not include a single mention of the words socialism or revolution. Now, there's there's no uh, avoiding the fact that, that Yugoslavia was a socialist state and fostered secularism, and that the mention Yugoslav anti-fascism went hand in hand with the revolution uh, and basically the abolishment of the particular type of rule that, that Haile Selassie represented. So how can we account for that? Uh, in my mind, context provides one answer to how this nomenclative intervention might have been a successful diplomatic um, stra strategy. While it is impossible to know if the readers picked up on the missing ideological designation, we might argue that it was implied. Um, we can, and I did invoke the principle of uh, quote unquote backstage knowledge context, a characteristic of the discourse that dictates its inherent limitlessness uh, and constitution by not only knowledge, but also the interests and presumptions of the hearer slash reader. Uh, this is from Paul Chilton. Uh, 
So I say that readers and listeners approach the text with certain knowledge and expectations, but also limitations in terms of memory, association, and processing capacity. So they might input their own meanings or miss the absence of expected content. Uh, so essentially, Tito might have offered the, the only solution acceptable for both the domestic audience and his foreign guest. Um, in, in, in this example, that, that would mean that the Yugoslav audience, accustomed to hearing historical associations of World War II hardship and uh, anti-fascist struggle uh, with a socialist revolution, uh, kind of just went over the fact that uh, the the one of the uh, the main components there, the socialist revolution, was was simply not not present. And I also believe that that this lexical veneer in Tito's speech was not accidental. Uh, the Yugoslav communist hierarchy uh, was deeply aware of the need to not, not to create an imposition on the relationship with the Ethiopian side. And it becomes obvious how intentional uh, this manipulation was when we look at the contextual transformation of the discourse and the discursive strategies employed by the Yugoslav side when observing the anti-fascist trope. Uh, important to note is, is definitely important to note is Tito's employment of discursive strategies to create the sense of separation between Yugoslavia and Ethiopia on one side and then the perceived other, quote unquote. Uh, and I put a, put a definition of, of what I mean by discursive strategies here by Ruth Wodak. Um, but I would I would like to focus on referential strategies and then uh, kind of shortly argumentation. Uh, and referential strategies are employed to construct the in and out groups uh, by the means of membership uh, categorizations or various metaphors and metonymies. And in this case, Tito fostered a sense of grouping between Yugoslavia and Ethiopia, but it, by including them in the club of, of, of anti-fascists. I mean, these two nations were anti-fascist before World War II and during World War II, but the, 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 the kind of the need to emphasize particularly that uh, element is what, what struck me. And I, I included a portion of, of, of uh, of that speech that was that was in the previous slide here to, to just give you an example of, of, of that and, and illustration because Tito Tito in this case required no metaphoric associations or metonymy when conjuring up images of past struggles and painting the enemy um, while speaking to the Ethiopian side. He could keep the essence of a fascist threat the same even by name, uh, even though the qualitative differences between the images the term might have invoked for the listeners are impossible to recreate. However, the, the name of that shared enemy was supposed to bound the two countries together nine years after the war. Uh, the memory of a, fa a fascist enemy, whatever that memory might have been, uh, put Yugoslavs and Ethiopians in the same basket of, of anti-fascist freedom fighters. And, and now, in this new Cold War context, lovers of independence in need of, of solidarity and, and interdependence also in the present. And, and with this speech, freedom fighting from the recent past, at least for, for Yugoslavs and Ethiopians, became synonymous with independence in determining their nation's fates in this new global division that was that was the Cold War. Uh, and so emphasizing that that anti-fascist component or World War II memory together with tropes of freedom and independence 
uh, served as a, as, a, as a kind of metonymy, maybe not in this case, uh, but in some future cases, uh, in order to create a, a, a kind of a known image of, of, of the Yugoslav past and, and, and include a socialist revolution without actually naming it. Uh, so anti-fascism served as a, as, a, as a kind of a surrogate for all the components of Yugoslav memory of World War II. And, uh, and as in this case, a catalyst for the relationship with Ethiopia, you know, encapsulating the presentist desire to stay independent from the global bloc division. And I have no doubt that it was Haile Selassie's present that that rendered the need for, for those uh, discursive uh, interventions by the Yugoslav regime. But it also, the visit, the visit represents an important marker uh, as I said, in in that in a shift of, of of foreign policy, but also in the study of the malleable nature of the Yugoslav communist regime's legitimacy discourse and the interplay between its inward and outward facing elements, and that's why I put this this last um, uh, the, the 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 last thesis kind of that it 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 fostered a multi directional legitimacy discourse. And of course, and hence the, the picture in the background going forward, this, this proved to be, and this is going to be my dissertation, this proved to be an immensely effective uh, diplomatic tool in legitimizing uh, Yugoslavia's position in the non-aligned movement because, you know, we have a white European nation basically leading an anti-colonial global south movement uh, and how that came to be or or how that uh, came to be kind of legitimized in the eyes of not only the world but Yugoslavs as well and in terms of, of, of historiography what what my argument I hope is going to bring is that uh, Currently, in, in historiography studying uh, Yugoslavia's involvement in, in non-alignment and, and you know the early Cold War, the the processes of domestic legitimizing and uh, legitimizing non-alignment and foreign policy are often observed separately. So you have you have researchers who argue, oh no, it was the successes of foreign policy that affected domestic legitimacy, that's why it was successful, or those looking at domestic legitimacy simply omit uh, foreign policy. I, I, I argue that it's, it's really blended. And, you know, the implication being that, that these, these two things cannot be observed separately simply because uh, the outward facing legitimacy discourse borrowed heavily from the domestic one, and then the domestic had major ramification because of foreign policy. And I'm going to stop there. I think that that's about 45 minutes uh, and basically open the floor for, for a conversation. I welcome any type of questions, comments, feedback. Uh, Please, if if I know this, this is kind of a short summary of what I'm trying to do with a with one piece of illustration. But if if any of this seems illogical, uh, please tell me, uh, and 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 maybe I can I can make some adjustments uh, going forward. But uh, thank you for attention for your attention, and thank you for for the opportunity to speak here today. Thank you, Philip, for this impressive and illuminating presentation. Uh, now I would like to open the floor to discussion. Uh, I have a few doubts myself, but at the beginning, I would like to give the opportunity to the audience to ask questions. So do we have any questions? OK, sure. Can you hear me? Uh huh. There was a yeah. there was a. I raised the hand like 
in the old the old school way and i don't know about charles yeah no 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 rush no rush go ahead okay. um I, thank you for your presentation i don't really have a, a question just some remarks some things that i mean since your project is somehow still in development there are no uh hard points there to to uh, uh um question i just had some some remarks some things that sort of crossed my mind uh, and maybe it could be useful for for you or for whatever deepening your argument or giving it another sort of a dimension uh, what what i thought for example was that um, you know like um uh Although the, the project, at least in the eyes of the, the, the party uh, after and during the World War II, was also a, a socialist project, I just somehow wanted to remind you all that, you know, like even the state was called socialist only in 63 or something like that. Uh, until that point, Yugoslavia was, uh, you, you know, it was a people's republic you 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 will remember this and also like the 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 institutions existing back then uh were still somehow you know like focused at least to my mind but also like it can be read from the official names of these institutions was uh, was a people's regime somehow you know like it was only afterwards that this socialist self identification was fully somehow assumed you will remember for example that the main you know like the the main institution leading the 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 country uh, uh out of the world war ii was the people's front you know not some sort of socialist front or whatever it was people's front and i mean china even now whatever the the content of the the state and whatever the policies of the state are it's still people's republic it's not it never sort of took upon this uh, this uh, socialist uh, identity or self uh, identification so this was some just something to to uh, to maybe have in mind and also somehow integrate into this whole historical argument that that you are uh, building upon so i guess i mean for, from the point of uh, Diplomacy. This also somehow played uh, played a role, you know. So there were, you know, like somehow, um, how would I say, like uh, this, this, uh, you know, and People's Front. This was not even. This was not even a a, a, a socialist necessarily a socialist and only socialist, you know, strategy it was also adopted in France and elsewhere, you know, as some sort of a general anti-fascist uh, uh, approach as some sort of a more general front of, of uh, fighting uh, uh, fascism. Um, yeah, so these two points, uh, and also this is just a, like a sort of a, a literature recommendation that was, uh, for me, very, very sort of eye-opening, especially in these terms of uh, in in the in terms of uh, these the the arguments that you started with, you know about uh, global connections and the way we experience the world, and this was like really a a book that was really uh, very sort of stimulating and eye opening for me in terms of thinking. Really, you know, like when did the globalization start in any sort of serious way although like nobody now uses this term anymore globalization it used to you know like 10 years ago was some somehow sort of uh forgotten but this uh, uh book by benedict anderson uh, you know like a, a very sort of a uh, well-known guy uh but the, the book is uh, the age of globalization anarchist and the anti-colonial imagination which, because you know, like you also somehow, I think, go into these territories of you know, like anti-colonial. Since this was also part of Yugoslav, uh, you know, involvement in the in the world scene or the involvement in the third uh, third world, so called. Uh, and this is like a 
it it somehow the 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 book builds this argument of uh you know like a, a globalization before the globalization somehow built through the actually existing um first you know communist international movement but especially in this uh, anarchist uh, international movement that somehow you know built this what you were saying like these imagined communities or communities mm -hmm. imagined across borders well before the whatever modern means of communication made this into a more tangible reality so yeah this these are just some points that maybe maybe may be helpful for you or maybe can you know like open up some other avenues for for things yeah thank you so much uh yeah it's it's kind of difficult to present the full scope of of my ideas in in such a limited format uh and yeah the dissertation is 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 kind of progressing fine and and um just on that note of of kind of what is socialist and what socialism is uh, I, I actually address that in the full scope of the project and, and that that kind of ideological revolution and, and following especially Jeremy Friedman's argument of that, that if you are to observe uh, the communist bloc, you have to observe it in terms of, of, of not this, 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 this kind of monolith, but in the terms of the malleable nature of, of communist socialist ideology and and uh, simply it as a as a process um and while i i kind of see that uh as an ideological evolution and and especially these 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 shifts and and, and this nomenclative shifts as as something worthy of expression I ultimately in in line with with my my methodology i see it as a as a as a form of uh, okay, as a form of an evolution, ideological evolution, but also somewhat of a legitimacy ploy, uh, because uh, in terms of the course of World War II, the immediate post-war developments, I don't think there was ever a doubt of what this regime was. Um, then everything else, in terms of legitimizing. The regime, yes, we can talk about, and I like like the fact that that you mentioned France because I have a whole section in my dissertation introduction discussing the Gaulle and French project of putting the whole French nation behind the anti-fascist movement, and it it is something that happened in Yugoslavia, but now going back into documents, newspapers, and all of that. It kind of did not happen until 1948. Uh, until 1948, this is a par excellence communist Soviet satellite. And that that's the image of it in public. And I mean, while, yes, you have the evolution of, of what Yugoslav socialism was and then self-management and the naming of institutions and the republic itself, the name of the party was the communist party. Uh, and that was before it was the League of of Communists. So I don't I think that there's a there's a kind of a, an issue with the true nature of of the regime. Uh, everything else that we can discuss in my mind is purely discursive. Uh, in terms of, of of global, yes, that that's actually an amazing point. And yeah, I I I, I have the book by 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 Benedict Anderson. Uh, and it's it's an amazing thing uh, to see how how these historiographical developments uh, are are kind of changing a lot of the perspectives in terms of globalization. Yeah, now it's a it's a dead term, you know. After the the end of the Cold War, th people thinking that the history ended and that we're now a tied. Uh, one happy global community, which now we're seeing we're not, and we're kind of in a second uh, Cold War. But uh, the shift in historiography starts there. Uh, these global networks existed, some argue, in ancient times. If you look at the uh, ancient Mediterranean uh there was not a Greek sphere, uh, an Egyptian sphere, or 
uh, a sphere of the Hittites, it was a kind of a, a globalized region with networks of, of cultural uh, uh, exchange, trade, whatever. So some now say, well, that's a that's a global system, you know, because they're not living their separate lives. They're they're living in in kind of connection to to each other. Uh, but yeah, obviously, I'm not I'm not working on 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 ancient history. I'm working on on kind of the implications of the Cold War, uh, and even the Cold War uh, change in that 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 global perspective in it being far more porous uh, than uh, a lot of the people initially thought. Um, and one of the one of the the consequences is that uh, we are uh, increasingly starting to acknowledge. Uh, a significant part of the world that was uh, not covered. Let's 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 say that. Yeah, if if that answers some of the, some of your questions. But thank you so much for your comments. Yeah, it helps a lot. Thank you. Uh, I can see one raised hand. Is it Charles? Hello, I'm Charlie, uh, University of Leuven in Belgium. Um, Pleasure. Back and forth between uh, Southeast Europe. And uh, I think I've crossed paths with a few of you and you've probably seen my name on a couple of these, but I usually just kind of stay quietly in the background listening as I'm a doctoral uh, researcher uh, as well. And uh, that's kind of uh, drives up my question. There's one thing I just needed to double check though in my notes. Um, you were talking social imaginaries or imagined communities uh, when you were talking there. You showed a, a um, uh, the, the history book that you um, that you had mentioned um, the the global histories. Do, what what term was it that you had put uh, alongside that? Uh, you were talking about feminist solidarities, looking at feminist solidarities, and I believe you were talking about social imaginaries. But some I think I might have wrote down imagined communities instead on that slide. Uh I don't, I don't, I don't actually remember. Maybe we can go back to the slide, but uh, it's, it's not a big it, thing. I, I just wanted to yeah. make sure I had it right. I was just giving examples of what what these approaches can be and what they can study. And, yeah, I mean, and that's, it's, it's, it's that's that's the gist of my question. Is with you looking at your conclusion and trying to follow that line from that slide to the conclusion about anti-fascist ideologies and that being a mm -hmm. kind of unifying. Uh, nomenclature, um, if I followed along with it correctly. But in dealing with these feminist solidarities and imagined communities and social imaginaries, I'm kind of curious of how you're progressing from those concepts towards that anti-fascist uh, uh, ideology as a unifying nomenclature um, within that historical, historic, historic context. And uh, because those are th some th some uh, concepts and uh, theoretical positions that I deal with a lot as well, and I haven't quite seen them in such a, uh, shall we say, context before. So I wanted to kind of maybe give you some space to talk about that more if there's any other thoughts that you had for that uh, with anti-fascism being an imagined, a social imaginary, if it, you know how that links to um uh, borrowing from or analyzing feminist solidarities today um etc cetera, etc cetera. but thank you for the interesting talk it was um, uh, a very interesting progression thank you well of course it it provided me with the theoretical foundation uh you know when you read books and and i i have to be honest in that uh you know coming to indiana i i was i first met this 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 concept of, of of global history and then you know i mentioned feminism because my advisor is is a professor of history and gender studies and and uh, that, that's kind of inherent in that that you're going to tackle that and you're going to read a lot of taking courses as well you're going to read a lot of books about you know feminist networks of of, of global solidarity and it, it's not tied but it it gives you kind it gave gave me an idea of okay so this is a foundation in that there was a kind of a, like you said a unifying framework for fostering these these relationships 
And it wasn't actually until I was in the archive and in the library in Belgrade when I started looking at these materials. And then I saw that my I, I knew I wanted to do a project about somehow tying uh, you know, Yugoslav World War II memory and, and foreign policy, but I did not have the project yet. And then I'm looking at these documents and you know, these newspapers. And the only thing that's constant there is anti-fascism. In that evolution of, of domestic memory politics uh, and, and Yugoslav's legitimation of, of non-alignment in, in, in foreign affairs in these speeches, everything else comes and goes. Anti-fascism is constantly there. And I did not, I decided to, to finish my project in 1961, but with 1961, but I, I read on and up until 1980, you know, Tito is this known uh, global star of, of di diplomatic star, more or less on the fact that he is the last surviving great anti-fascist. You know, he is the great, uh, the last great hero of World War II. And that, that's a lot of, uh, well, you know, people talk about charisma and diplomatic acumen as well. But uh, when he's presented to the world in whatever context from 1945 until 1980, and not just Tito, this goes for Yugoslavia as, 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 as a country, Yugoslavs as, an, as a nation, they're represented as anti-fascist. Uh, and so that's where I thought, okay, so maybe this can be my kind of quote unquote network of solidarity uh, and, and just use what people uh, develop for other contexts uh, for, for this one. And uh, I'm, I'm still, I'm kind of developing that as I'm writing, but it feels as if it has a, a lot of, a lot of foundation and that uh, you cannot escape from it simply from the, from the material. Uh, if that, if that answers your question. Yeah, no, it, it definitely does. And that uh, kind of clarifies it a little bit for me. I, the only suggestion, follow up, last comment I would throw in there is maybe perhaps think about speaking about in pluralisms with uh, anti fascist solidarities. Um, yeah, that's, yeah, that's something that I've encountered as, as well from uh, borrowing from feminist epistemologies and everything is emphasizing that pluralism so that you're not inadvertently flattening out some kind of imagined or not in imagined space. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have some other questions? I have, I, I do not know how to raise hand on it, so I okay. couldn't, but uh, yeah, thank you again uh, for your presentation. For me, um, you raised a very, some of the very interesting points about language and truth. So the uh, I am also researching uh, post-Soviet states and slash post-communist states. Uh, I'm uh, here in Vilnius, uh, in Lithuania. Uh, so my kind not not question but more of like a suggestion was about uh, how the European, in, especially in Europe, the identities and you also mentioned national identities uh, were created based on the languages in majority of Europe, the only exception being Yugoslavia. Uh, later, when the national identities were created and these being ethnic identities rather than the linguistic identities. So maybe this is something also for uh, like a food for thought for you. And uh, the second aspect of it uh, being you discuss more in a philosophical terms about the truth, like how do we perceive uh, and truth in, in terms of memories, because uh, how I would try to explain truth is that it is a function of time and space, and it has been projected. It, it is uh, a narrative building, uh, because historically, we cannot uh, study or we cannot uh, 
projected in an objective way. It is always subjective. And, and that also the creation of identity after World War II, which you were also talking about, um, also took shape in most part of the other world also, which was not Europe, which was colonized by Europe. And in those regions, uh, uh, Yugoslavia found themselves related to it, which you also mentioned in the, with the Global South, basically. So it was very interesting. And yeah, thank you. These were some of my uh, comments or suggestions. Thank you so much. And these are amazing comments because yes, they are very stimulating. Uh, I mean, and they are food for thought. And, and I guess it is interesting to see how, you know, language uh, went from, from being this, this, this uh, kind of the determinant for uh, collective identities in the 19th century um, kind of became not the determinant, but uh, 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 primarily a tool of, of political and uh, ideological identity in the 20th century. Uh, I, I, I'm not, probably not smart enough to analyze that on a, on a larger scale, uh, nor experienced enough. Uh, somebody else is going to have to do that. Um, at this point, I, I, I'm not sure if I'm well equipped to to comment on the larger European scale. Uh, I would I would stick to Yugoslavia, but in terms of of everything said about the concept of truth, I I fully agree. I have I have nothing to add. Thank you. Do we have some other questions? If not, I would like to ask something. Sure. Uh, so, Philip, do you identify any pertinent examples of diplomacy with memory in today today's political horizon and increasing global tension? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, uh, one of the one of the reasons why I I decided uh, how I actually discovered this 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 whole thing is well you know, the political situation. And it has been talk, especially in the States, about this second Cold War. Uh, and it kind of started with China. Uh, but then, you know, Putin decided that that he needs to be uh, in the center of attention as always. Um, but what the books I read, uh, that, that that kind of uh, emphasized uh, again a par excellence example of, of of this 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 memory diplomacy uh, now is China uh, because China is is very vigorously trying to refashion its World War II legacy uh, from from kind of a, a national humiliation or even not to refashion the national humiliation, but to, to kind of switch it into a new national strength and to establish itself as, as kind of the dominant power in East Asia, if not the whole world. Uh, obviously, in East Asia, the main kind of uh, relationship or opposition uh, being Japan and, and now kind of having that legacy of, of Japanese crimes against the Chinese in World War II gives them a sort of, of, of a higher moral ground for their uh, geostrategic claims. Uh, that's, that's one, you know, in February 2022, the war in Ukraine started, and the first thing that, that Putin said is, oh, we're denazifying Ukraine in sort of a, 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 a kind of a, we're trying to finish what was started in World War II. And while, you know, people say, well, obviously that, that's, a, that's a ploy for domestic legitimacy and, and, and Putin trying to explain this attack to Russians, I, I would say that it, it's equally as effective in, in, in the international sphere because 
take Serbia. There's a lot of people who believe that uh, Ukraine is to blame, that, that there's a Nazi regime in Kiev, not just Serbia. Take to the United States. There's a lot of people here, usually Trump supporters, who feel that, uh, you know, it was it, it's the Nazis' fault. Uh, Putin had to defend Russia and uh, kind of the U.S. should stay away because they're 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 kind of on the wrong side here, or our involvement is is too great financially or logistically. Uh, so I would I would I would definitely say you know it's something that that that's it feels very alive in the in the world today uh, in terms of how alliances are formed. Uh, but also in terms of how different countries or nations or whatever uh, stake their claim in this in this kind of global global game uh, that that's that, that that's happening and new divisions obviously. Thank you. Um, it looks like we have no more questions and. It seems to me that we have exceeded the time. Uh, thanks again to Philip, especially for Thank meeting you so us much. this early in the morning. It's 7 a.m. at his home. So thank you all for joining us and participating in the discussion. Uh, today's seminar was the first in this fellowship cycle, and I hope that it was interesting enough to motivate you to follow the talks in the coming weeks. So see you all next Thursday. Thank you. Thank you once more. Thank, Thank you. you.